We'll let this last little flow come on in, get comfortable, and we'll get started. I know there was an alert set out, I guess, like, session went a little long, so we're going to start here in just a few minutes, and then we'll run through noon, I think, is what I heard. Okay, good. We will not go past noon, because we know what happens <laughs> past noon. It is not good. Anybody who's had, like, an 11 o'clock service knows about 12 o'clock, everybody starts sort of, come on back, come on back. <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, we're going to go and get started. We are uh, just excited, honestly, to uh, just kind of be able to host and process um, uh, just everything regarding uh, parenting teenagers and uh, just share, honestly, a little bit from um, my wife and I's uh, just role as parents and the things that God's taught us, both through His Word and then really practically in parenting our kids. And uh, just excited to share. I just want you guys to know from the beginning. Um, that, uh, that walking into something like parenting is one of the most unnerving, exposing realities that we walk through. And I think one of the most biggest difficulties, just to kind of frame this discussion up today, is just to help you guys understand that like, parenting is one of those things where few people have the vantage point to how we parent like our own kids. It's like one of those things like preaching everyone can see and respond to. But you, you exist in this thing and then you feel like, oh, I just got this sort of figured out and then they like graduate. And you're like, oh. And, and then if you have multiple kids, you're like, well, we finally figured some things out. And then you have, you know, it kind of goes like that in parenting. And, and so we're just excited just to kind of uh, share a little bit uh, from our story. And uh, in a session like this, my heart um, for you is that there would just be something that you could take in the midst of what God has given you the opportunity to steward and be able to apply it in a way that would be beneficial both for uh, the work of God um, through your parenting and in the life of your kids. And so uh, my name is Brian Beement. Um, I am the lead pastor at uh, Christ Church in North Muskegon, Michigan. So we planted in 2015 and uh, just excited to be here at this conference. I've been to a lot of conferences like this and uh, love what God is doing in the collective and excited for workshops like these in the way that they can be such a benefit to people as we continue to want to grow. Um, in our time together, like I said, we're going to give you um, some high-level principles of some things that we've learned uh, reflect on some scriptures that we think will be really helpful to us in and around parenting, and uh, particularly parenting teenagers. And, uh, and so I would love uh, my wife just to kind of introduce herself and introduce our family. Of our kids. Oh, here's our kids. There they are. <laughs> um, we have four kids. Our oldest daughter, her name is Eliana. She's a freshman at Cedarville this year, and um, it's one of those transitional periods right now. It's wonderful and sad all at the same time. Um, and then Josiah is going to be, or he is a senior this year. And then Micah is eighth grade, and Alicia is our sixth grader. So we're kind of in the throes of. Uh, like adult-ish, down to preteen, and <laughs> we have learned a ton. We are so thankful for the people that have been around us that have spoken into um, our parenting, that mm -hmm. have um, circled around us in that, and um, just a little bit about me. Um, I was a pastor's kid growing up, so I kind of know what that is to grow up as pastor's children and can speak into that for my kids. Um, and I work at a school. I'm a parapro with special ed kids, so I get the whole gamut of all the things. But um, we're super excited to be here and just share kind of the things that we have learned and hopefully give you guys some just good encouragement. Yeah. yeah, encouragement. That's a better word than convince. Awesome. <laughs> Can you, um, can you just pray for our time and pray for all the things that everyone's coming in here just kind of wanting and desiring yes, in this absolutely. time? God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you that we can be here, that we can worship you and give you all the glory. And God, as parents, we kind of come with open hands. We don't know how to do this without you. And God, I pray that as we um, just sit and learn today, um, God, that you would show us how we can
can best parent our children. And it's different for every kid, even in your, our own family. But God, you give us your work and you give us guidance. And we just say that you give us everything for life and for godliness. And God, we pray that as we parent our teens, as we walk alongside people who are parenting their teens, God, we love you and thank you for all that you give us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You know, one of the things that um, that is so interesting about parenting is, you know, there's there's really when you think about it, specific scriptures that go right at parenting. It's relatively minimal. There's a lot for um, pastoring. There's a lot for eldering. There's a lot for some of the things that we see uh, throughout scripture. But there's really uh, not a lot. And and what I want to do at the very beginning here. And just a kind of a, a, a quick overview is just give you um, an ability to sort of start to think about, if you haven't done this, one of the best practices that's helped me as a parent is just to go, am I taking some of these primary passages from different places in scripture that speak to things like relationships or the context of the gospel? And am I taking those and contextualizing those and thinking through the call of those in my role as a parent. One of the biggest issues that we can have is, is that we can go to church and do our church thing and then come home and think that that's, that that's somehow supposed to be a, a different place. We're, we're, we should be administering and thinking about the kingdom of God at home uh, with our children so specifically. And so just some of the verses to think about this in the context of parenting teenagers particularly. I picked the ones out that I feel like start to come up more and more as your kids start to transition into different seasons. Uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen and 24, 6. Where there is an abundance of counselors, there is, in both of those verses, safety and victory. Safety and victory. And I just wrote down here, do not parent alone. Like, don't parent alone. I think sometimes in the insecurity of what's happening in our kids' lives, we tend to, particularly in some of the teenage years, are kind of like, oh, uh, I'm trying to manage the reality of what's happening. And I'll just say that I think one of the things that, the God, that God has uh, helped us with is a sense of we don't parent alone in these seasons. We bring... I want to bring and usher as many extra believers into my kids' lives as I can. I love the fact that, um, that when my daughter graduated uh, last, last year, sorry, earlier this year, at the end of the summer before she left, we invited uh, 10 people that she felt like had had the most influence on her faith. And we sat around a table and just, they spoke words of life into her and prayed for her, and there were a lot of tears, and, um, but I looked around the table, and I was like, the fruit of what's happened in her life is not, is not us, it's also all of these people, and so just a beautiful, um, some proverbs to apply, Psalm 127.1, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain, um, it, it, you are you're working through the power of God to influence your, your teenagers' lives. The work that happens is a work of the Lord. And to depend in that way and remember that is key. Uh, Third John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And just to go, God, that is my heart, that they wouldn't just know things about God, but they'd be walking in the truth. And I'd be wanting that, aiming for that, processing that way. Luke 10, 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor, and I put parentheses, your teenage children as yourself. Like, if, if we can't love there, like we've got a lot of other things that need to be processed through. And um, then Galatians 5, 22 and 23, do your, I wrote down here the question, do your teenagers... See the supernatural growth of spiritual fruit in your life. Do they have access to your life as a teenager to the point where they can see it, where they know how some fruit is still a little, not quite as formed as well as other fruit? Are you talking about that openly with them? Um, 
Galatians 6.1, this could be applied to the church for sure, but it needs to be applied to teenagers. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of, does anyone know what the word is at the end? Gentleness. In a spirit of gentleness. Even when you're like, you disobeyed me. <laughs> like, spirit of gentleness. And I think that is massively missing in a lot of Christian homes in the name of discipline, particularly important at the teenage level. And then Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Are you, do you have a perspective of your home with your teenagers that you're forming disciples over time so that they would make a public profession of their faith in baptism and so that they would be taught to observe what Jesus has commanded them? That's, that's the context. And so what, what we want to try to do is, is just kind of frame this up for you guys and give you guys, you know, some pictures of how we can see some of these scriptures. This sort of is the foundational scriptures that have informed some of the things we want uh, to share about. Um, and so this is uh, a kind of a little bit of, of how we wanted to kind of frame up our, our sort of posture or our tone that we think should inform and direct the way that we parent uh, teenagers. And let me start with the story. I think, I think, Amy, you were on this. I wasn't, I, I went on this retreat uh, when I was leading student ministries. This was like 2005 when my daughter um, had just been born, my first daughter. And I went on this, um, I went on this student ministry retreat and I'll, I'll never forget seeing this this guy and this, this male leader with this student ministries that I was, I was speaking on their retreat. I, didn't, I, I hadn't been around the student ministries, but I went to speak. And I saw this leader with this, uh, with this high school student, and I went, I watched, it was like, it was like, a, like a dad age. You know, I'm in, my like, I'm in my like early 30s. I had just had my first child. And I'm sort of watching parents of, of teenagers and seeing this. And I'm on this youth retreat and I see this guy in his like 40s. Like, and I normally had thought like, you know, high school leaders need to be younger to really connect. But this guy just had this connection with this student. And they were praying together and this kid was, was crying and sharing some things. And I was watching this interaction. I was so blown away by it, being a student ministry leader that I wanted to ask this guy how, like, how he had like just felt the call to love students the way he did. And I pulled him aside and I said, you know, how long have you been involved in the ministry? And I just saw your relationship with that, with that teenager. And the relationship you have with him is so genuine and real. And he's like, that's my son. And in that moment I went, I, I want to learn everything I can from you because that's the relationship I want with my children when they're a teenager. And it was in the midst of that that um, he gave me some things that have sort of developed in my mind, but one of the principles he said that stuck with me is he said, we have to change our posture on parenting teenagers. Like it's our posture. It's, it's the same thing when I was, when I was about to, I, I remember people would say something uh, in the world, would, would, would mention something about marriage when I was about to marry Amy, and they're like, oh man, you're going for the old ball and chain? And I was like, yeah, I, I think God's redeemed marriage a bit more than that, <laughs> you know? And, um, but there's this attitude that people are like, just wait till they become teenagers. And how, many, how many have heard that? Right? And and of course, there's all the stories. And I want to be sensitive to the fact that some of you are walking in some really hard stories right now. But even if that's the case, our posture has to be informed by the gospel. And, and I just, I just want, to, I want to just give some principles I think have been helpful for us as, as I've spent really since 2004, 2005, Wanting to live into the vision that this dad couldn't even really articulate, but in the lunch I had with him and the amount of questions I asked him, 
I just got a picture and a vision for what can be as opposed to what people just assume is has to be. And, uh, you know, one of them is just root your joy in the gospel. So let's anchor parents' hearts right now. Like, you know, I was thinking about, I, I was thinking about, as Dave was sharing, about the glory of man. And I think some of us, parent, wanting the glory of our kids. And we feel their dissatisfaction or their rejection. And it, it hurts us in ways we can't even like really express at times. We've got to root our joy in the gospel. That's where our joy has got to come from. Not how much our kids like love us or have an affection for us or are obeying us or listening to us or even have a joy and a satisfaction that we feel because they're doing these great things. And even that can create a pressure on them that can subtly, I think, do the opposite of what the gospel would do. Um, address your parenting anxiety. Um, address your parenting anxiety. Address it uh, collectively, I think. Amy and I have done a good job of like sharing that back and forth with each other and talking honestly about that. Um, stop assuming the worst. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'll be honest. Like Sometimes I'm just like waiting for the, anybody else like waiting for it to go wrong? Like If you get on a good trajectory and you're like, no, 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 it, it can't. Just wait, just wait, just wait. Like, like I, I see something. Is something going on there? And I think our kids feel our anxiety more than we realize. And, um, and then the last one is just look for opportunities to have fun. Like I, I, I think our, our kids need a release valve, particularly in our culture today, and just to have parents who like genuinely are looking for ways to have fun with them. Finding something that you might do that maybe you wouldn't like to do that you now do because you love your child. And you want to meet them right in the midst of, of that. And so, change your attitude. I just wanted to frame that up. And so, um, so now I just want to walk through um, just sort of, uh, sort of seven principles. And we're going to hit these pretty quick. And, and our prayer and desire in preparing for this was just to give you maybe one thing that can be sort of helpful to you. And if there's more than that, praise God. Um, that's our heart. But um, the first one is, is live an authentic faith. Live in authentic faith. Um, I am deeply thankful uh, for my wife and, um, and the way that, that, that she lives her faith in with our kids and honestly with others is uh, really beautiful. And uh, it really starts with the two greatest commandments. And we say these things, but the question I have for you is, is, is it palatable to your kids? Like, do they see this? That you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor and you love your neighbor as yourself. Like, teenagers have this radar for authenticity. They have a radar for it. And um, we want to be authentic inside and outside the home and... Uh, there's some ways that I think, um, Amy, if you would share just some of the things that uh, as we were talking, some of the things you've seen and the ways you've seen this play out in our home and particularly in your life. Absolutely. So um, we have kind of established, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but we've established a family line. And as I get to teenage <coughs> years, you know you got to do that. Um, and so during that time, we sit down and we just have intentional time of, Sometimes it's like digging into the word. Other times it's just we've got to pray. That's like the highs and lows and go. Um, but one time I think um, sometimes it's really hard to be authentic with your kids about where, where you are. I mean, they see it. <laughs> but to be really and truly honest. And I think um, the thing that really came to mind as we were talking about this is, I've, I mean, to be authentic with you guys, I've really been struggling to be um, – just, I call it my desert. I'm like in the desert. Like the discipline of being in the word, the discipline of prayer. I've just been in a really dry place. And so, I don't know, a couple months ago, we were sitting around and um, I just shared that. I was like, listen, you guys, I, I don't know how else to say this, but I am just struggling. I'm struggling to be in the word. I'm struggling to sit and pray. And I want, I want more for that. 
and then to watch my children, and it makes me cry every time I think about it, because to watch my children, like, look at me with that face of, like, wow, and then to say, hey, I'm right there, too, and to have them pray over me for that is phenomenal. And then to the, like, the full circle, a couple weeks ago, we were just getting into bed, and our 17-year-old son came and just flopped himself right in the middle of our of us and was like, Mom, Dad, we've been doing this Holy Rhythms class at church. And he said, this is what I need to do. Like, I'm struggling to get in the Word. Here's, here's my plan. This is what I need. Can you guys pray for me? And just thinking, like, hey, you know what? Such a full circle. Like, I did that with them, and then he could come and felt like, hey, I know who I can go to. And for me, that was a huge, a huge step just to see the mm-hmm. We're being authentic, yeah. and I love that. Yeah, so cool. yeah. I think that um, I I don't I don't think it's different than than the way that you garner respect from people in any relationship is by having an authentic faith, giving our kids spaces to um, space to process, space to doubt, space to pro- particularly pastors' kids. She grew up as a pastor's kid. I did not. I, I grew up as a pagan. Um, and so, like, my Sunday morning was, like, WWF and Kansas City Chiefs. That was it. So, I know, super awesome. And examples to follow. And, uh, and, and so, like, I want my kids to not ever feel like they have to be something for the church. Like, if there's anything that is going to literally hollow out their soul, really for anybody, I want them to just love Jesus and just be enamored with the person of Jesus. And so it has to start here with that. And um, yeah, yeah, please, please. I think just the concept of disclosure breeds disclosure, right? Yeah. Like we all, if we can be honest with our kids, they they can be honest with us. And just realizing where we are in that. Yeah. So live in authentic faith, that's an that's a easy start. The next one is promote spiritual decisions. Now, I use the word promote very carefully. Um, I think that once your kids start to move into sort of that preteen, like our daughter in sixth grade, all the way up, it's promote spiritual decisions, don't press. Don't press. Because I want to desire authenticity. I want to present it. I want to talk about it. I, I want to bring it up regularly. Um, but if you press, it can be either a sort of empty religious decision. That's one option. Or if you have a tremendous amount of favor in their lives even, it could be something that is just as empty as a religious decision for the sake of, of just doing it. It can also become to make, the parent, to make their parents happy which also is not a great foundation for like further discipleship decisions. And, um, and so we press for authenticity before action. Um, one of the examples that we've got here is, so my daughter is a year and a half older than my son, and she is everything that you would expect a firstborn to be. And so, you know, like, the, the one that always is forward thinking, the one is the planner, the one is the organizer, the one will give you a report on anything. When we left our kids with her, when we finally could leave your kids alone, you know, that glorious day as a parent. When you look at all the parents with younger children, you're just like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You'll get there eventually. And, you know, we, we leave them with Ellie and we get back and Ellie's got like a, a moment by moment summary of all the misbehavior of the younger siblings. And, you know, she's that person. And, uh, you know, she's in sixth grade, Josiah's in fifth grade, and Josiah just comes to us and is like, Dad, I want to get baptized. And, of course, I'm, like, processing through it with him. I'm, like, awesome, testing the authenticity of this, like, working through all that. And then I go to Amy and I go, oh, shoot. What kind of pressure is that going to put on Ellie? Like, she's just as involved in the church. She's just as turned towards it, but she just hasn't made that decision or that move. How do we navigate that? Like, do we navigate it? Do we not? Are we sensitive to it? And we were sensitive to it because we're because I'm the lead pastor, and how could that make her feel? And we went to her, and, and we knew it was like a few months off. It wasn't like we were walking out that afternoon to the lake to baptize Josiah, and we walked through a process. But we went to Ellie, and we said, listen, 
Josiah's come to us about baptism. I don't know if you've been thinking about baptism, and I want no pressure on you in this decision, but this could be a real time for you just to process through it, because we're going to be talking about it a lot in our family as it uh, leads up to Josiah. And she felt like she had the space to make that decision, and uh, she came back to us, I think it was a few weeks later, and was like, I want to get baptized. And then you have like the sweet parent moment that you don't want to press, but if you get it, it's really sweet, where both of your, co- the older two kids got baptized on the same day. But it wasn't like I went to him and got, and I said, Ellie, I got a great idea. We should get you and Siah baptized. You're for sure of already believing in Christ. Let's get you baptized. It was not that. It was incredibly careful, and if there's anybody that would have tried to create that moment, it would have been me. And so, because that's just a great picture moment, right? Right, like pastors, like you get that, you're like, this is so good. Everyone's going to think our family's so healthy. (laughs) And so, um, so I think really important on that, again, it is a promote spiritual decisions, don't press for them. And that could be on a lot of different lines besides baptism. Um, Okay, third one. A model servant leadership. Model servant leadership. I'm encourage them to serve in and around the church to process the questions like we just have kind of talked with our kids about, hey, as followers of Jesus Christ, like we're called to serve. And so where are we going to serve? But not trying again to press that. But just having that conversation often and 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 why are you serving? And uh, Amy, when we were talking, you had a great example from, uh, with Josiah about that. Yeah, um, once you get in this uh, middle school, we really encourage them to find interests. And um, Josiah, I mean, the natural one is go help in the little kids' group, because they always need help. <laughs> They're always, and um, so Josiah was faithfully serving with those preschoolers. Lord bless him. <laughs> <Don't put> me <laughs> in the anyway, but um, so he was serving, and you could just tell he was just kind of like, fine, I take care of kids, I play, it's great. Um, But then the opportunity came for him to do some production and get involved more um, with that. And he wrestled with that because he was serving one place and serving the other, and I do worship, and lead pastor, he's early, and, you know, my oldest was also helping out with worship stuff. And so it was to watch him wrestle through that. It was such a great experience. To go, okay, where's your heart in serving? Like, are you serving? We know that we encourage you to serve. But where do, where do you feel called? What does the Lord put as a, just a passion for you? And he was like, worship production. Awesome. So, you know, then had to encourage him to go talk to the children's person. Because I'm not going to take that. Like, so he's going to have to go and explain yep. why. And that's awesome. Those are all um, learning things. Um, but just to watch him then go from, okay, I'm, I'm working with these kids into production, then now he's, like, the heart of worship is starting, he's playing guitar, and he's starting to sing, and all these things, that you get to see that bread in him, because that was a passion for him, and not just being in there, like, you go serve somewhere for yeah. the park and rec, right? Yeah, I think that I think that one of the things around this is, that we want to model for our kids, there's can be a, there can be a reality that they don't quite understand because they look, particularly for those of you that are occupationally a part of the church and you have a role, they look at that as like, that's your job. So you have to go like, you have to really purpose with your kids, go one underneath that and go just because that's my job and what I'm called to, that your level of expectation is not going to be equal and I'm not going to make it equal for you. In addition, I think the thing is, is that I want to allow my teenager to navigate those conversations, like Amy said. Like, I want you to go to the children's person and process that you feel like more called to production and, uh, and it, you know, if your children's person mishandles that and, you know, condemns your child, that's a whole nother <laughs> workshop that Jeremiah would love to lead <laughs> because I'm not touching that one. Um, that's a hard situation. Um, but just those things are really sweet. And what it allows uh, your, your staff people or other leaders is to, again, have this access to the development of your child. 
And I'll never forget, Josiah was early in production, and he one time in the morning spilt, um, he spilt coffee on the Apple keyboard, and it, it you know, it was done. And he went on, he was, he was so like upset, he went on the computer and found out how much they were, which, you know, Apple anything is not cheap. And he was like in tears and almost, and so this became this awesome discipleship moment where I was like, process that with Chris. And Chris was like, you know, you'll have to pay out of your paycheck. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> but, um, but, but it was just another these cool moments of teaching that you can't create those, but they're beautiful when you get the opportunity. And how you respond in those moments. Teach your kids so much more than whatever you do in Bible lesson time, you know, in family worship. And being involved, as you know, when you are serving, you have a different community around you. You have voices that are speaking in just as we talked about of, you know, it's, it's a group, it's a group effort here. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. This one, super key. Uh, I think this is one of the biggest moves you need to make in sort of uh, parenting teenagers is transition from authoritative to collaborative leadership. Authoritative to collaborative leadership. This is not an easy gear for parents to make. And I would say, Whichever parent, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use some of the classic, I think, overplayed gender stereotypes on this. Whichever parent is a bit more type A and intense, that's for sure Amy. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's for sure me. Um, I had to learn this more than she did. Um, that transition is so incredibly critical to parenting teens. It is teaching them now to think, not just to obey. I honestly, looking back at like our kids in like the younger years, I was just like, keep them alive. Keep them from hurting someone else or themselves pretty much every day. I remember saying like, what I say right away with a happy heart. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> yeah, you're like, we're going to get just like, we're going we're gonna to help you just yeah sort of take the edge off your incredible sinfulness. At this point, though, you, you have to teach your kids to think. And you want to transition away from being, like I feel this even with my kids, and I've got great relationships, particularly with my two older ones right now. And, and I hear people say, something, say some things around this where they go, they go, man, your children just have such a high respect for you. Now that could be like sweet, but there's a part of that that I actually... I actually want that to not feel as heavy maybe over them. And I want to invite them into thinking through and processing through uh, their world. And so I want to transition from an authority figure to a friend, counselor, and advisor. Those sorts of words are really good words. Friend, counselor, advisor. So for instance, let's think about like worldview issues, which everyone's has to deal with in the context of parenting teenagers. So let's think about things like LGBTQ, um, all of the issues there that are so prevalent in our culture right now, all of the sort of just, you know, rampant sexuality, all of those things. You can think from a place of authority with your children or you can teach them to think rightly about the subject. And we want to transition in that from authority to community because now what we're wanting to do is, is invite our kids into the decisions. And so to whatever degree our kids have sort of earned that and shown a faithfulness, particularly when there's a faithfulness to the Lord, I'm like, we are now like, we're doing family together. Like you can speak into this. And there's been some ways we've even seen that happen. Give some examples. Yeah. video games, all the things, right? And so we said, we want you guys to come up with a principle over your vacation. Because we very could easily could have said, all phones stay at home, no video games, we're family time, forced family time, right? <laughs> we're going to have fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun. awesome. <laughs> um, but we were so surprised because I thought, well, maybe they'll stay like an hour or whatever. But they really, they were like, 
No screen. I, I looked at Brian like, what? I was like, oh no. <laughs> this backfired. <laughs> Super authentic. <laughs> but things like that, because their rules were way stricter than we would have ever thought. And it was so beautiful. It was so great. And then you got, you have that, and then a couple of weeks ago, you know, our, our daughter's off in college, and we're like, how do we keep this house clean again? I started working again full time because the school year started. And, and it was like, okay, guys, um, just to sit down, how is this floor thing going to work? Because we had it, we had a good system going. Now Eliana's gone, and now mom's back at work too. So how are yeah. we going to do this? And their idea was way better than ours. And they were like, "What we have didn't work, mom. So let's do it this way." Mm -hmm. And just to like bring them in on, "Hey guys, this is your family too." Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, some of it we'll have to go. No, like this is how we're going to do that, right? I mean, they are eleven. S still need some leadership from but us. They still yeah. need some so yeah. Those are some very practical things. Yep. Sure. One of the one of the things where Amy was a really great radar for me on this subject that I think probably formed it in my heart the most was my son, I did not realize I grew up with two little brothers and I seem to have navigated the like daughter thing better than the son thing. So Eliana, like through junior high, you know, you hear all the, the stories of junior high and girls, and I was kinda like with Ellie for, by God's grace, um, it just navigated that a little bit more smoothly. When I got to Josiah, I didn't realize that boys, I just maybe, I, maybe I, that part of my mind was just blacked out. From like 11 to 13, cry all the time. And I like couldn't like, and so I was wanting to like push or encourage and he would just fold. And so I would just be like, well, I mean, I'm trying to train him to be a man, so I'll just push more. <laughs> that went really well. It went really well. <laughs> and I'll never forget there was a moment when, when Amy came to me. I think just I was in seventh grade, end of seventh grade. And she said to me, she goes, if you continue to push him like you're pushing him, you're going to lose him. And I sort of had to like look at myself in the mirror and go, she's right. His heart is not like, he's not designed like me. I had to start to see the, the nuances and beauty of the way God created him. And it was in that season where I just realized like he would just take longer. And when there was these moments where I wanted to see something beautiful happen in his life, I had to lead him differently. And I couldn't just be like, well, this is the way I lead. This is my personality. Like, deal with it, son. Like, that's so... Um, that's such a leadership philosophy that needs to change, not just in the home, but in the church. Amen? And um, absolutely. And there's this beautiful nuancing of leadership with Josiah. And into that moment, Josiah, um, I just started just listening to him and asking more questions and trying to understand where his heart was on different circumstances and situations and things he was navigating. I started to discover that his ability to handle a lot of stuff stressed him out more than maybe it would other. And uh, the way he was processing, I had to walk through that. I also gave him space to push back with respect. So it wasn't the fact, I, wasn't, I had to move from a place of, I'm not against your pushing back, let's just do it in a respectful way. Let's have an honest conversation about it. And what came out of that was just beauty. And honestly, um, I, I tell people all the time, my greatest distraction to what I'm supposed to be doing in ministry at the church is that, um, you know, Ellie betrayed me and went off to college. So I feel very still like I'm, I, I'm messing with her all the time around that. But, but my two oldest have become like some of my best friends. Like so often I'm like, shoot, I need to hang out with people from the church because I just hang out with them. Um, because of, of, of what uh, the relationship is like. And it would not have been like that if it wasn't for the voice of my wife and my ability to go, my way I'm leading has to change. And it's really summed up here. Um, transition from authoritative to collaborative leadership. Okay, a few more, a little more quickly. Um, this one, um, establish a family night. Um, when, you, when, you got, when you got your littler kids, there's a bit more rhythm. Um, and things sort of, uh, you know, we were really careful with uh, the amount of outside activities we were engaged in. 
Um, we tried not to try to live vicariously through my kids on any level, academic, musical, sports, any of that. Um, and so we, we sort of tended to, with our little, when our kids were little, have more time. Once they got into junior high and high school, um, they were involved in more activities that could happen right in the school, and we didn't have to drive them all the crazy places uh, with four kids. And um, we really realized the importance of just having a family night. Um, it's not the only time in the week that our family is together around the dinner table, but it's for sure the one that we protect the most. Has our teenagers got work schedules? We were like, Thursday night, no. Um, now, are, is there flexibility in that? Are we doing this like, like Pharisees? No. It's not 100%, but it's definitely 80%, yeah, maybe 98%. Um, I think that what we do in that is make sure that we're connecting with them, not just running a curriculum. So we connect, we share, we sometimes will study or process through something biblically, and we pray together. We just try to keep it really simple. We keep it simple because we want it to be authentic. We're, we're training our kids in the rigors and craziness of life. What does it look like just to stop, commune with God, commune with others, and then, you know, move forward and enjoy life and what God's doing in and through us. And so, um, establish a family night is uh, really critical in this season. Um, this one's big, process relationships openly. Process relationships openly. So, um, we, we started this we started this sort of really simple co- uh, communication with our kids when they, when they started to bring uh, uh, their friends to our home. And we've tried to have just a real open door to friends being in our home. Um, not only is it beautiful for us to know our kids, not just because we want to be like, who are they? And have this really like skeptical perspective, but also because we want to love them well. And we want to showcase the gospel to them. And um, one of the things we, we started to do is we said, when your friends came over, there's like red light friends, yellow light friends, and green light friends. Red light, and, and we'll process with them around that. We'll just be like, here's some of the things that if someone comes in and they're rude and they're standoffish and they're like, you know, language is bad or whatever, just any indication that like, what the heck's going on? We want to teach our kids to like, how do we navigate that sort of situation? How do we navigate that? Yellow is like, man, we're just not sure. And even having conversations with our kids about how they feel about those friends. And because sometimes they feel kind of pressed to to like have a relationship with this person that's a friend. And, um, And then, you know, we tell our kids when you make really good decisions, like with your friends, we just, we go, they have the green light. They can come over anytime. They can hang out. We'll, we'll treat them like family. I mean, we just, we, we love that. And, and I think it comes from, without question, my wife's giftedness in hospitality and just loves opening our home to allow that to happen. And um, that hospitality mindset has a big influence uh, with your teens. If you're always like, they're so loud, as opposed to jumping in and being loud with them, game changer. <laughs> if you can do that, just for a few moments, you will, like, your teenager, like, that can totally flip their perspective, as opposed to you being guarded, you're welcoming, and um, just, and and the other thing I would say on this one, and then Amy's going to share something, is have a sincere love for your kids' friends. Like, look for ways to bless them. By the way, that may be some of you, uh, it may be your best gospel opportunity, particularly, like, our kids were all the way through, I know there's different educational decisions for your kids. Our kids have been public school the whole entire way, and it has been the most phenomenal gospel opportunities for us to have. Not only with the kids, but then the kids to the parents. Um, And it has just been a great, great joy, and honestly, one of my favorite parts about having, like when when my daughter went off to college, I was like, aw, like we made some, like we really liked her friends, and like some of them were believers, some of them weren't. I was like, I lost you to college and now all your friends too? Like, this is terrible. I'm still dealing with it, okay? Walking through the stages of grief, as you've seen in this session. And so, um, Amy, why don't you share just one of, like, our favorite sort of testimonies and stories in and around this? Yeah. Um, so, Eliana had a friend in middle school, and she was kind of, like, 
like this yellow light print. She would go over to her house sometimes. We didn't always love what was happening, not with Eliana, but just in her household in general, so it was very guarded. Um, but Layla kept continuing to come over, and she was from a broken home, and to watch um, her just kind of love our family, like she just kept coming over. Now they, they went to different high schools after middle school, and I was like, well, we probably won't see Layla anymore. Well, no, it just got more intense. They were more intentional because now she had to come over and to see and to hang out for a while. It wasn't just a quick at school thing. And to watch Layla and Eliana's relationship um, foster through our family of like understanding what it looks like to have a whole family, what it looks like to, we, we weren't shy. If she was there on family night, guess what? She's gonna sit down and have family night with us. Um, all of those things. And you guys, two, was it two years ago? <coughs> Eliana came running up the stairs. <gasps> Guess what? Layla's getting baptized. And I'm like, what? I, she and her mom found a church. She got baptized. And um, now she and I, and this is the sweetest part, Eliana's off to college. She and I get to lead a um, middle she stayed in the area. girls um, small, small group. group. And so she started coming to our church, and what an amazing thing for her just to watch her. And, I mean, we would do things like before they would go up on stage for their musical productions, I'd circle them around and pray or pray for them in the car, and 90% of them weren't believers, but I was like, <laughs> we're just going to pray, and everybody's open for that, right, or usually. And so just to watch the, that green light relationship, she could come in. In fact, the other day, I walked into my house, and on the... Um, refrigerator just I have some notes of some sort and she just said hey um, there was a note from Layla she'd come when we were gone ah! like, in our home my favorite daughter was here thanks for not eating my pizza <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm <laughs> it's those sort of things as as we were able to love her yeah. um, that yeah so it's yeah. just an amazing opportunity you guys all know this I mean you it was beautiful yeah, it is yeah, Layla has become, I mean, she's just become like a daughter to us. And, you know, and we've just seen God do a beautiful work through our daughter. And now we're like benefiting from that. And our church is seeing her now minister alongside of Amy. It's just a, it's amazing. sweet it's sweet um, one more thing on relationships that we feel like has been really helpful for us is um, how do you deal with and how do you process romantic relationships so I know that sometimes the issue with teenagers um, it's been completely different with our kids some of our kids are more are, are think about it um, my daughter Eliana I'm like thinking at age 22 I'm gonna have to be like um, you probably should think about marriage at some point she just is like, and, and I feel bad for any guy that would try to date her. She's fierce, and, um, and they'd have to step up. Um, here's what we've done. that I don't, we, we didn't get advice on this. It's just kind of how we've done it, and, and it, it is, is opened up the conversation. We started early in like junior high. We started talking openly about the weaknesses of worldly relationships. We didn't have a lot of rules on relationships. We just started talking about worldly relationships and we were like, you know what? You know what's really obvious to kids, particularly when they're around these relationships, is how absurd they are. And, and when you see the amount of the, the over, uh, the, like the giving themselves to someone and the way that plays out mentally and emotionally, they're in those conversations with their friends. And so we just started talking about it and we just sort of honestly started laughing about it and going, man, what God offers is so much better. Like, it makes more sense. It's... It, you, you can reason yourself rightly to a person that would be, that would be life-giving to you, and we model that in our marriage, and we talk about the weaknesses and the strengths and how you work through that and all of those things. And we just started talking about that. Every child's going to be different in the way they're drawn to that. I've seen it. And, and so you're going to have to contextualize that for your child. But we just started walking through that with him really practically, and we found that our kids started to, started to point it out also. 
And I'll never forget my son having a conversation. He goes, Dad, I just know one of my friends, he's in a really unhealthy relationship, and I've just seen how it's totally changed him. And I'm like, what's changed about him? And I just start to unpack that. And he's telling the story now. But he's telling the narrative that's actually becoming the narrative upon which he's making decisions now, right? Because I didn't tell him, I didn't make it a law, hey, you can't date until you're 16 and you, you know, have a job and you, you know, like all of these these, 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 these like things that they've got to check off to get to it. I'm like, no, let's just process it. And recently, Josiah came to me and was like, uh, like, you know, hey, there's this girl, like, and I could kind of see clearly that the girl liked him and that he kind of liked the girl. I was getting awful giggly around that certain person. And I just said, hey, wh- what are you thinking about? And I had a really open conversation about, dad, she's two years younger than me. I, I, I don't know if I really want to. I'm like, that's okay if you don't want to. I wasn't like, man, she's really great. You should, you should date. But I also wasn't like, no, don't, absolutely don't date. And, uh, and so those conversations, just having them openly, I think is incredibly healthy. And so um, let's hit this last one and then we'll take some time for questions. Tread carefully with social media. Um, I think that this is probably the place, this is, this is without question, um, we, our kids got phones um, with a lot of restrictions in junior high, about seventh grade, I think. People have different convictions on that, live with whatever convictions. Uh, the 10 ways your, phone, your smartphone is, is, is changing you by Tony Wright is one of the best books. So that book I worked through, I worked through some, some people even in our church. Um, that, when the world is worried about something they've created, that's a really good sign that the church should probably be worried about it. When the people who created the social media platforms are like, we don't let our kids on it, the church should not be late to that party, okay? And, and so on this one, you can, you, can, you, can, you can do the research. It's super easy. It's everywhere. The mental health, particularly of young girls who have access to social media, is, it's insane. It's honestly tragic right now in our culture. When I encounter a parent who has a child uh, of elementary or junior high or really any, who's on something like Snapchat, I'm like, what are you doing? And, oh, oh no, I, I think I, I know they're friends and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. Sure you do. Um, this was the principle, and here's the, way we, here's the way we navigated it. We said when our kids got to uh, 16, when it was 15 or 16, um, high school, we said if you walk through 10 ways your smartphone is changing you, and you walk through that book, and you write a you just write, I want you to think through it. What are the principles upon which you're going to live with a smartphone and in the midst of social media? Then we'll process and let's talk about what that looks like. Um, my daughter was like, you know, read the book and she was like, yeah, no. <laughs> I didn't have to got, tell her. We never, we never, we never got it. We never got the like, just, hey, let's process through it. And what are your convictions? She was just like, my convictions are I don't want to have convictions. I don't want to deal with it. And she literally just did nothing. Yeah. Until she was about to leave for college, and then, and she had to find a roommate. And, find a roommate and use it. So we, we, and obviously at that point we were like, okay, like go ahead, like navigate it now, and let's process through it, and let's continue to do that. And, um, and so yeah, what was like? There were some excuses that we navigated yeah, through in that. Say, I, and you guys probably, if your kids are alive, then you probably, <laughs> <laughs> um, if they are walking and moving with their community. Um, one of the things that Eliana and, and Josiah both came to us and was like, Mom, I'm not getting any information from my, my friends because they all have Snapchat and that's how everybody communicates. Even teachers were communicating only snapping each other. And, um, and I'm like, I, there's got to be a way around. Like, it's just, it, and there are certain, yeah, it was just a straight no from us about Snapchat. But, and there's plenty of others, but we just had to say, listen, you have to work it out. So her, her friends knew <laughs> that everybody else was snapping, but then they'd have to text Eliana 
And sometimes she didn't get it. Sometimes she didn't get the memo that everybody was going to wherever. Um, and I know that was disappointing for her, but at the same time, because of the conviction that she had established, um, she was like, well, I guess that's kind of what I, you know, that's have to deal with. I have to yeah. deal with because I don't have the social media that everybody has. And so for her, that was a great thing. Now, others of our kids, I have a feeling once uh, my daughter gets older, my youngest, we might battle a little more just because of her social media. The way she's wired, yeah. Um, but, um, but and what did, what did Ellie tell us at the end? She, um, as, after she, so when she started doing college um, and trying to find a roommate, and that's how you look for roommates. If you don't know, if you're not there, they, all the social stuff, how they figure it out. Um, but what she said to us was the best thing that you guys did was to um, not allow me to have Snapchat. Not a, and, and Even I social media in general. Social media yeah. in general. Um, I, like, like you said, she chose not to. But that was the best decision that was. She, she told us that was her best decision because it, it's protecting the future. Yeah. And yep. she saw that. We didn't tell her that. She, she saw, saw it that. and observed that. Yeah. And I think that was like. We, well, we actually walked through these principles with Ellie, you know, and just said, and that was the one that she said out of all of them that she said was the most important. And so let me leave you with this and then we'll finish. We're, we're past time. Sorry. Um, my warning to parents would be this. On social media and the use of your phones, um, if you don't set a good example and if you don't process through it openly, God bless you. Like, because you've removed your ability to speak to that if they don't see you processing through it. I'm not saying it has to be perfect, but if you've lost yourself into your phone, your child will follow suit. And what they might end up doing, even if what you're doing is, is like accessing Christian websites all the time and, you know, and whatever, I, I don't know. Or even on your Bible on your phone. Um, they will go into that world, but they likely won't land in as safe of a place. And so we've got to process carefully on that and think through that and work in the community that we have to work that out. So, um, you know, here's what we'll do. If anybody has questions for us, um, I I'm sorry, we've, we've gone past time, but let me pray for us and then we're available if you've got questions. God, I just thank you. Um, it is a, a kind of a ridiculous opportunity and ridiculous endeavor to be a parent. And uh, God, I just am reminded of how much we need you and uh, how much our, our children, our lives that you have created, that we steward, that we have a, really a, a responsibility in that stewardship that changes over time, and it, 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 it transforms over time. And I pray, God, that there might just be some things that we might do differently. Just to, uh, Maybe it's our attitude changing, or maybe it's uh, some, some ways that we lead, or some actual actions in our lives that are shaped and changed by a desire just to see our children's hearts pointed towards Jesus. And I pray that we would um, give them the space, particularly as teenagers, uh, to begin to step into adulthood, to take responsibility for their actions, to manifest a pure and beautiful love for Jesus Christ and the gospel and the kingdom that was not pressed by us as parents, but was formed through our work in cooperation with the ch local church and the Spirit of God and the word of God to bring about a fruit, God, that I pray would have great impact um, into the future. And Father, for some here uh, today who are struggling acutely with a situation or a circumstance, I pray that they would rush to the people that can surround them, walk with them, and lean on during uh, the very difficult realities of whatever that might be. And so we just trust you with that, God. Thank you for this day. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks.